If you're a .NET developer, you might just be getting used to C Sharp 10. Well, Microsoft has released a preview of some of the features in C Sharp 11. Let's take a look at them. So I'm in Visual Studio on Windows, though this should be applicable everywhere you can write C Sharp. And this is actually not the preview. This is just Visual Studio 2022. And I've created a console app. Could have done that up from the console as well. And I want to be able to enable the preview of C Sharp 11. It's not really reliant on a version of .NET Core. It's actually reliant on which of the compilers it's using. So if we go ahead and look at the project file itself, we need to add a piece in here called lang version and put in here preview. This tells it to use the new version of the compiler. And if we go ahead and just compile it real quick, see it continues to compile. There's nothing really in here that's any different console app there's we're using top level statements all this came in prior versions but there's a few different features here i wanted to talk about one of the things to know about opting into c sharp 11 is that a lot of the features just aren't done i wanted to just give you a taste of it but please don't start using this in production code so one of the first things i want to talk about is new lines in interpolations and so if we have some string here, right? And I can just say, hello world, regular old string. But if I put that magic dollar sign in front of it, it's going to allow us to use this syntax to inject or to interpolate our strings with some other data. So let's create just a uh, O equals new object, right? Um, I could, this could be anything. And... It'd be easy to say something like get hash code, right? This is a stupid, stupid usage of this, but you can see how this works. Before C Sharp 11, you couldn't have line breaks inside these interpolation brackets. So this is perfectly valid in C Sharp 11. Now in this example, it would be stupid to do this, but when you're doing more complex things, being able to break them off into multiple lines can be really useful. And it does mean that between those brackets is just valid C Sharp, right? And so you could have more complex usage there. Though I'm not sure you would need it in every case, but it is nice to know that you have that. If we compile before Turning on the preview, this would error out. It wouldn't know what to do with this because it wasn't expecting new lines in there. And next, I want to talk about generic attributes. Now, we've always been able to create, uh, let's go ahead and create a class called my attribute that derives from attributes. And I'll create a quick constructor for that. We've always been able to have type information in here, but usually it was because we could pass in our type, right? And then we could just store that as part of our attribute so we would know what the data was and we could do something with it. Actually, I'll make this a property so that the user can get to it, right? We have always been able to do this. And so if we have a method, let's say void test me and passes in some string and we're just going to say console dot right line x um, I'm able to use this attribute my attribute by passing in let's say type of string We've always been able to do that by just passing in this type but it's been harder to deal with it in a generic way because attributes don't support generics. Now, just being able to change this to be able to say something like string is not in itself that interesting, but let's go ahead and support this by saying this is going to allow us to have a T in there. And then I can just say that instead of passing in our type, we have it implicitly in our attribute object, right? And so if I come over here and I say T our type, then I can use that attribute type wherever I want it to, right? I could have methods based on it or 
whatever you want. And we'll go ahead and put a question mark there just to make it non-nullable, just so that we can actually instantiate this. I do have nullable references turned on in this project as well. Now, on its own, this isn't a ho- on its own. This isn't a whole lot better than using type of and then passing in the type. But the magic here, of course, is being able to have type constraints, right? Being able to limit what kind of types are supported. And so in this way, that attribute can't be a string because a string isn't that type. And so let's change this to object and then it'll work because it has a constructor unlike the string class. And so this enables some um, edge cases. It isn't going to be transformative to everybody, but it is a very interesting new feature inside C-Sharp 11. This is effectively going to generate the same sort of code that you're getting from C-Sharp 10, just a different way of getting at it. I also want to talk about something called parameter null checking. So I'm going to add... And in this test me, we'll notice that this string, we don't have to really check because we're using nullable, just to make sure that you trust me on this. We're using uh, enable nullable reference types. Obviously, if you weren't using reference types, this may be a little different, but you have the same problem. And that is, uh, if x is null, you need to throw new exception whatever the exception would be, to guarantee that x is not null here. But of course, we're dealing with nullable, so I'm going to actually tell it to make this uh, a nullable string, right? And so this really comes into where we have to write this code, especially if we have a bunch of them that is just ugly, because we don't want to necessarily just write out a null string. Now in C Sharp 11, we can actually add two exclamation points at the end, and it will guarantee that it throws an exception if the string is null. Now again, in this case, it might not be that important, and that's why you're sort of getting this warning, but this will guarantee that that string, that nullable string, isn't null when it's passed in here. Because you could imagine, in some cases, the people calling us might want to be able to pass in their nullable string where you're going to assume it's not null. And this tells the compiler to make that check instead of writing your own code. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this because we're getting into this space where we're using these exclamation and question marks and other objects to imply these little things. And we have to keep them all in our head, like the question mark afterwards or doing, you know, a question mark period when there's a possible null and all of that other things. Um, but it's nice that we have a way to just check null parameters, both at the class level and at the method level. So I, I quite like this as a syntax. I wish it were a little different than double exclamation point, but that's where we're at today. And the last feature I want to show you actually doesn't work inside of .NET 6 projects. You actually need a .NET 7 project. And of course, we can't do it here in Visual Studio unless you're running the preview. So let's go ahead and just open this in Visual Studio Code just to be able to do it pretty easily. Okay, now that I have it in Visual Studio Code, I'm going to open that back up and let's go ahead and add this. The IntelliCode in here is not ready for C Sharp 11. But let's open up that CS proj and let's change this to a .NET 7. I have installed the preview of .NET 7 as well. And so if we build this, we can see that it did build. There are some warnings here, but those are the same warnings we saw before. And this should let us go ahead and do something that they call raw string literals. And we have a common problem sometimes that if you want to include a structure, an XML file, a JSON file, JSON file is a pretty easy one to think about, is that if I have to do something like name, I have to use double quotes to tell it that I actually want the correct thing here, right? And because we're not using the at here, we could have used backslash as well. But what this means is I can't copy and paste this as JSON someplace. I can't grab this and just put this in here. And I especially can't paste whole documents, right? Imagine this being a whole complex document. 
And raw string literals are really meant to solve that. So let's change this quote to three quotes. And IntelliSense will cr freak out a little. And with three quotes, it's going to take whatever is between those two as a literal. It's going to say, this is actually what it needs to look at. Oh, I'm missing a couple. And if we compile this, even though it really hates the syntax inside the editor, I should figure out how to turn those off. This is perfectly valid. Now, a couple of rules here. One is that you have to have the triple quotes beginning and ending on their own line. So that's why you see the document is separate here. And you can do interpolation. Now we have a little bit of a problem here because if we just add a dollar sign, it's gonna to start to think that this is the beginning of interpolation. And so they've come up with a really crazy way to get around this. And that is, it will expect interpolation to work based on how many of these dollar signs are used. If this were XML, we could get away with just using that and then doing something like some string, right? That would more normally work. But because we are using JSON where we have curly braces already, we're gonna have to put two dollar signs in here and use two brackets to tell it that this is interpolated versus what these are. So if we compile that, we'll see it did successfully compile it. And so it's treating this. So if I go copy, aside from the interpolation, any JSON string here and just paste it here, I don't have to do all those annoying fix-ups that I always do, search for a single string, search for a single quote, replace it with double quote. Now, I'm sort of a fan of the way that JavaScript does this with the backtick, but there was a lot of discussion about what literal to use here, and they decided to go with this. So I'm sure the first thing you're thinking is, why didn't they just use the backtick? They do have some good reasoning, and you can go over to GitHub and read a long history of why. But let's talk about that last piece. And so if you go over to github.com.net Rosalind, you'll be able to dig down into the docs and there is a file called language feature status. I'll actually put on the screen here a short link to show you how to get to that page. And this is important because this talks about all the new features. C Sharp Next is going to be C Sharp 11. And we can see in here, I'll try not to move it too much, what state it's in. And if it's been merged, it's going to be in one of the previews. You'll see something like name of parameter here, which is a new feature, that it's in progress, which means it's not been implemented or merged yet. And then something like default in deconstruction, which is a feature I really like, it's been implemented, but not merged. So it's not available yet. So you can watch to see how these are progressing. And some of these might end up becoming features that get pushed to the next version, or some of them might be executed. But this is a great way to see where C Sharp is going. And what I like here is that the feature itself, you can click over like raw string literals, and you can go to the actual proposal and start to look at the discussions about how they got to every single place and what the specs are going to be that they're actually implementing. So hopefully that got you interested in what is coming in C-Sharp next or C-Sharp 11. Lots of features here that I haven't been implemented, so I'm not going to talk about them or show you how they work. But do read through this, especially when you start to think about things that might be actually affecting you. Thanks for joining me for another coding short. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really does help me. And I'll see you next time.